Hi, it's Stuart McPhee here and I'm coming to you from Hong Kong this morning. Uh, I'm spending a couple of days um, here in Hong Kong before I head to China for the weekend to speak an event. And I'm joined uh, by Ray Barros, one of my mentors who happens to live in Hong Kong. And Ray, thanks very much for um, joining me and I know um, your time is limited so thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, for those who don't know Ray, um, correct me if I'm wrong here Ray, but um, you were a lawyer by trade I guess and, and did university and, and had your own practice law practice, started trading early 70s, gave up the practice in early 80s and really took on trading as a full-time role. So we're talking back in early 80s, so we're talking many, many years and you've written many books and do a lot of speaking circuits, uh, speaking things around the world and and um, you've certainly been in the market a long time. So um, thanks for joining well, me. Well, thanks, Stuart. Um, now, I also know you manage funds and I think people in my position, that's something that we aspire to, is to get other people's money and have people put trust in us um, to manage their money and I know you do that um, just before we start like do you perhaps approach managing funds a slightly different like a methodology wise and say if you're trading your own account is there differences in the way you do it there is a difference in terms of the amount of risk you can take for clients uh, so that's about the only difference. I'm a little bit more aggressive on my own account. I know what I'm, what my risk tolerance is. Uh, clients are less willing to um, lose money, if I can put it that way. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So you, mm. you want to manage the risk a little bit more carefully and reduce their exposure a little bit. So, you know, with my clients, I'm happy to make somewhere between 20 to 25% per annum. Mm. I push the boundaries a little bit on my own account. Yeah, I think the key word you said then was tolerance, wasn't it? If you lose some money, you sort of can deal with it. But if you if you then have to front up to other people and let, and let them know, oh, by the way, we've had a bad quarter, that tolerance, you don't know where their tolerance sits so far as losing money. So Yeah, well, part of the problems you face when you're managing money is the fact that you only have to have a couple of losing months and, and they're ready to withdraw. And I, uh, I get around that problem by tying people up for three years. They can't <laughs> take their money out. Sure. <laughs> okay, well, that's, um, that's probably good advice. Should I ever manage funds well, in the future? Well, the Give them, give them a stop loss. I mean, we have a maximum loss of 30% of initial capital or peak equity, whichever is the greater. Right. So, you know, they have a built-in. The, the maximum they can lose is 30% of their capital. Right. And um, so far, not wood, that's never occurred. Hmm. And we tie them up for three to five years, depending on uh, who they are. Uh, Singaporeans, for example, have a list are less willing to tie up for five years. I prefer five because okay. if you can have a 20% per annum return, you will double your money in that period. Sure, sure. Okay, which is appealing to anyone, I exactly. guess. Exactly. And look, Ray, I've heard you speak at many events, trading events and the like, and I reckon one of your, I don't know if you've ever advertised this, but I think one of your pet topics that you really like to talk about is managing risk. Are you able to, um, are you able to perhaps comment or just comment on why that's such a pet topic of yours and what advice you'd have to people about managing risk and why it's so important? Well, I think it comes from my background. I mean, I started off, I sold the legal practice and in 12 months blew that in trading. Wow. Um, I just said in my blog, we're doing the hero's journey at the moment in the blog and if you have a chance, have a read of it, it's quite an interesting thing. And what I tell you there is that Christine, my wife, was the one that funded me until I started to become successful. I can't tell you the amount of money that I went through. I mean, I, I blew a lot of money. Oh, yeah. And it was because I didn't manage my risk. It, I, I followed the systems all right. I would follow my rules. That was never too much of an issue. Uh, the rules may or may not work, but that following the rules wasn't an issue. I just wouldn't manage my position sizing and I wouldn't manage my losses. So to me, that's where the exec consistent execution of your risk management is where the profits are. The plan is fine, but any plan with any sort of man edge will, will get you some return. Mm -hmm. So that's why I focus on risk so much. So it really came from some difficulties or challenges early on <laughs> where you were almost forced upon to recognize and appreciate how important managing risk was. Absolutely. Was that position size? Was it, um, say, where do you set your stops or what specifically did it was all the above? Except for the stops. I mean, the stops, um, I didn't manage the stops initially. And, and then I felt, well, this is a sucker's game because you read every book to put the stops in. Hmm. But then I didn't manage uh, portfolio risk. You know, if you're, if you're spread over a number of instruments, how much of and you, even if you risk 2% per instrument and you've got 20 instruments open, you know, suddenly you've got 20% open. Yes. So you've got, to, you've got to have that. You've got to have how much you're going to risk per trade mm. uh, or how many contracts you're going to take. Mm. So all of those things I had to learn the hard way. I'm sorry to hear that, but I think a lot of people go through that, don't they? A lot of people make a lot of mistakes early on and it's only through making those mistakes yourself I mean, you can read 20 books that say, you know, position size well and do this and do this, and you sort of go, yeah, I'm sure it's important, but I'll, 
deal with that later, but then you go through it yourself, yeah. make all those mistakes, and it hurts. And what you said was, you know, Chris, your wife funded you early on, and that probably didn't sit terribly well with you. Um, so it forces you to, I guess, yeah, it, you know, it, it recognize does. that they're and important. I think earlier on, we were, you know, a couple of times we've chatted, I've mentioned to you that I have an excuse, you see. I can say that back in my day, no one was there to really assist. Yes. I mean, the stuff we had, there's nothing compared to the assistance you get today. Hmm. I mean, you've got some really good people out there trying to help. In my day, the first person that I came across was Pete Stettelmeyer, and that was a good almost uh, six years, seven years before I um, had, had, had been losing this money. So. Hmm. Okay, so it's a real big difference. It's now, a real which is big terrific. difference. Yeah. Um, off risk management, and you and I both know how important that is, and I hope others, you know, realise how important managing risk is. But a lot of questions we get from clients, it's all about entry. And you know, you do the seminar thing, and someone will talk about managing risk, and you might have a good size audience, but then someone else is talking about, you know, something entry, and the and the room, it's standing room only because yes. everyone wants, because this is the key to success. What you, I guess, what are your thoughts on entry, and and why people focus on it so much, and do you have guidance to people about entry and methodologies and setups? And all? Yeah, I, I think they have a place. I, th I think your trading set of rules, NP, has probably the least important part. In my view, identifying where the trend's going to continue or change, where you're going to take a trade, and whether that trade's setting up is much more important. That The entry almost necessarily follows those things. Okay. Secondly, you're never ever going to, well, I've what, been 30, 30 years in the markets, I've sold the exact high once, and I can't remember when I bought the low. Mm. I don't think I've ever done it. So at some point after entering the market, you're going to take some heat. Mm. So you need to know your method with your methodology how much heat is normal. And uh, so got John 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 Sweeney uh, wrote a book called Maximum Adverse Excursion, Maximum Favorable right. Excursion. Yes. I would recommend that to anybody that is talking about trading and talking about entry, because that approach identifies statistically how much heat you ought to be able to take on in your system mm. and still make a profit. Mm. Now, if you know that, it takes the pressure away from, I've got to buy the exact low, or you know, we want to buy it within two ticks, or sell it within two ticks. And not often, some systems just aren't geared for that sort of thing. You know? mm. It's because you know a bit beforehand, you know, it gives you a bit of confidence to do the entry anyway. Um, on entry, I also uh, had a bit of a running uh, debate recently about indicators, and I've, I've made my point on indicators very clear, but do you have any view, like, have you used indicators before? Did you go through a search of which one was the best one? And <laughs> I mean, obviously there was a time back long ago where indicators didn't exist, and, um, but yeah. anyway, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what, what's your well, view on indicators? When I first started, indicators didn't exist. Okay. And then Wells Wilder came out with this... Um, RSI. He wrote a book called New Adventures in Technical Analysis, which is a blight on the technical world as far as I'm concerned. And the reason is everything you can do with technical indicators, you can do by observation and by statistical analysis. Now, the problem with technical indicators, from my point of view, is that there were actually two problems. One, they're one step removed from the bar chart. The bar chart's already one step removed from reality. It's a representation of the fear and greed, okay. but it's the best we've got. Yes, it then is. we take the best we've got and reduce it, create another area of error, if I can put it that way, hmm. and create RSIs and MACDs and stochastics and what have you. And the problem then becomes people stop understanding what the nature of markets are, that they're really a reflection of the fear and greed of the players in the market, and those turn out with certain patterns. Mm. They may not repeat exactly, but they will rhyme. I think, um, what's his name, Mark Twain said that. <laughs> um, but people look at indicators. I mean, look at the RSI, divergence. Oh, you know, overbought at 80, oversold yeah, at yeah. 20. <laughs> I won't go on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, to me, indicators um, are probably a nice way to start for a novice because they're, they're very clear if you do it in a clear manner. But you get out of kindergarten at some point in your trading career and you leave indicators behind. I think they're a necessary step to building a, um, an understanding of how markets work, mm. especially if you're a mechanically orientated person. But at some point, as I say, you move out of kindergarten into college. Don't you 